My name is Donna McTaggart, and it's really nice to have you here. I usually start with a question, um, but today there's like a more pressing one. How many people will be at the Roughnecks game tomorrow night <laughs> at 7 o'clock? Oh my gosh, I have to say, um, anybody that knows me for like two minutes knows that I'm a huge um, lacrosse fan. And even me in the middle of the season, maybe two thirds of the season, um, um, would not have actually put money on this, the fact that we we're playing in the big dance tomorrow. So very exciting. Donna McTaggart, welcome to Social Media Breakfast. How many people have actually not attended one before? Yeah, good. Okay, and Space Bar? Uh, the Arrow? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, can we do that again? Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Okay, that's great. I Welcome here. I hope that you enjoy the experience. And I want to say that this is one place where if you look around this room and you see people looking at the tweet wall or looking down at their phones, probably, um, that's actually an action that is not only accepted in this room, it's encouraged. It, this is a room where we actually, um, we do a lot of online communication, as much online as we do during the presentation our last two um, months, we actually um, trended in Canada. And that is only because the conversation that, that you guys do, um, the information that the presenters gave um, from the podium. And so I'm, I'm very sad. So let's say, I don't know, um, we were up against Comic-Con last time and we were at Heritage Park um, for our big 50th um, in March. So uh, today we're talking about a little different kind of um, energy conversation about um, about the anti-spam law, but I know that uh, everybody's really interested, as I am myself, in the um, in the conversation of um, what Jeff is going to talk to us about today. The um, it's amazing how anybody that's actually put together an event understands that a two-hour event takes many, many hours, and you wonder why because it seems so simple. You walk in, you hear somebody talk, and you have something to drink and eat, and you leave. Oh my gosh, the amount of conversations and emails and stuff that happen. And so this happens with a team of people. And so today we're actually in a room that's, um, we have bright lights, that's not always something. And um, so I'm actually going to point out people today. Sorry, I'm trying to turn off my ringer here. Um, the, uh, so the people on the committee, um, so who's in here? Okay, at the back, Laura, can you wave your hand? Laura, um, if you uh, check the Twitter feed, you will actually um, talk with Laura. Melanie is here at the front, and we have, a LinkedIn, we have a LinkedIn group, and we would love for you to join the conversation in LinkedIn, and Melanie is the one that takes care of that. Um, uh, Scott, where are you? Scott's in the back, and Scott is somebody that helps us when we need something, and we can always call Scott. We need it picked up. We need something. Uh, something set up or whatever, he's our, our go-to guy. Um, you met Terry at the, um, when you signed in today for the security, thank you for doing that. And I'm gonna try and remember at the end to remind you to sign out. But for this, the building that we're in today, they really would like to know when, when people have left the building. So if we could try and remember to do that. Catherine, Catherine, oh, there's Terry, Terry Wave. We just talked about you, Terry. <laughs> and uh, disparaging things, of course. And Catherine, um, uh, uh, Catherine does, um, works with our press releases. She's uh, got a, the gift with words. And uh, so, and, and Melanie and uh, Laura and Catherine, when we have a speaker, they usually spend some time with the speaker, getting the presentation, make sure we have slides, um, the cohesive part of that. Kayla is in the back. Kayla is um, with uh, Matrix, but she comes down here on her own time and actually helps with the camera equipment, helps with the video, and we are in the process of getting a process in place to get the videos on our website. We, um, uh, Crystal on our committee is not here today, but Crystal and, um, and Mike have actually put together our website, so now it's been, um, it's been up for a month, and I hope you've had the opportunity if you um, are here today and aren't getting information about our uh, press releases, et cetera, there's a place to add yourself to our mailing list on our website where I can finally say that. Um, I'll be honest, the next thing, I don't think anybody actually checked it this month to add the names to actually do the next step of making sure you're on the press release. I have to tell you, this is um, for a, the kind of group we are. We, uh, we don't always have our act together ourselves. Just, uh, I've, I've, had this, I've had this rolling, and so you may have noticed this, but these are just um, past um, sponsors for venues. And we've had th this event 
is a challenge sometimes because we have it in a lot of different places and going back to when planning events when you do an event at the first time at any place that's always a little bit and we do almost every one of our events is a first time event so uh, these uh, people have been happy to um, great to work with um, these are ongoing sponsors that we have uh, market wire um, does our press releases uh, matrix we get equipment from them neil we're very excited to have neil zeller um, doing photography at each event that will eventually end up on our website. Um, Calgary videographer is Travis, and you guys have seen him walking around with a camera. So Neil and Travis are right in the back. Tweetwall Pro, we're really excited to have the Tweetwalls, and Corey um, is here today. And uh, the uh, Corey um, has found a sponsor for the Tweetwall today, and it's uh, Timmy's only. If you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, and you are on Twitter, check out uh, tw Timmy's only. Um, okay, so that brings us to this venue, and we are very excited to be here today. I, it's it's a, a privilege that we get to uh, walk into spaces um, in different parts of the city, and this has been, I've heard so many great comments already this morning about it. I'm going to mention one thing, and then Chad, if you want to come up here and speak to us for a few minutes. Um, if you are looking for the washrooms, if you have not seen them already, if you go out towards the cow, go around the elevators, there's an... Uh, the um, a hallway just past the elevators and you'll find the washrooms down there okay so chat yeah. well, chat's with um with the atv well thanks donna i am an innovation consultant here at atv financial uh first and foremost i wanted to welcome all of you to the campus which i like to call the castle so thank you all for coming it's a, a pleasure and a joy to see you all here today the social media breakfast has been an integral part in my career and life since I moved to Calgary about four or five years ago, so it's definitely a true honor to see you all here today. Um, one thing that I wanted to let you all know about, there's a little project that I'm working on, it's called Alberta Booster, and essentially what it is, it's like the Kickstarter for Alberta-based small to medium-sized businesses. Um, we're hosting an event, a big splash event next Wednesday the 28th at the Libertine. Um, you can follow us on uh, hashtag ElevatorYYC. Get more information at www.TheElevatorYYC.ca. Uh, um, it's going to be a really fun event. We've launched nine campaigns on the 20th. They're doing a week sprint. The top five performing campaigns are going to be invited to pitch live to a crowd of up to 200 people all of which are going to have a $20 promotional code to boost a business that night. And so something super excited about and would definitely love to see you there. If you tweet underneath uh, Elevator YYC, we're going to be giving out five sets of two tickets each. And so if you are interested in, in coming, I definitely invite you to tweet and uh, we will try to hook you up. Thanks so much. So great building, great space. I'm still a little bit, I was a little bit um, surprised that we came out to what appears to be the boondocks and yet really it's not that far like from Barlow and 36 or whatever. But the parking, parking, you don't expect parking to be an issue in this part of the, the world. And so Chet uh, worked her magic. Um, we were going to try and um, have extra spots over at the LRT which is way across Mady Trail and Chet worked her magic with Fiber. Did anybody park at Fiberville today? <laughs> Okay, great. And I don't know, I forgot to do this myself. So if somebody can find, is Fiber Built on Twitter? I don't know. So somehow we should thank them, but thank you for Chet for organizing that. So our, I mentioned that breakfast is a little unusual today and our sponsor for breakfast, and I'm very grateful to have um, caffeinated um, computing. And John is here today. And John, would you, are you interested in saying a few words to this group of people? <laughs> John is a typical business owner that is excited about his business, not so excited to talk in front of a group of people. I don't know John that well. I could totally relate to you. Um, so what I will say is that um, we wanted to do, um, so thank you to Melanie for, for hooking um, John up with Social Media Breakfast, and, and Melanie approached me and said, okay, what are we going to do for food? And we'd like to do something different. What do you think? And sometimes sometimes ideas take a while to happen and Tuesday in the middle of the night I had an idea and that was if you count not very many hours ago and so I sent it to Melanie and said okay what do you think and then realized that I had forgotten 
in the year and a half that I've had this idea to actually speak to my friend Tanya from Brown Bagging It to let her know that I had this in the back of my mind. So Tanya has made this happen. Um, so Brown Bagging It is a charity um, in Calgary that feeds kids and with, brown, with lunches. And they have a great organization. They use a ton of volunteers. And Tanya was great, um, kind enough today to not only bring food with her, but um, she's going to speak to us for a couple of minutes. And if you want to explain what you brought with you, Tanya, would you mind doing that? Oh, yeah. Do you want to grab here? And so Tanya is the executive director with uh, Brown Bagging It for Calgary's Kids. So if you don't. Thanks guys, I need to, I'm tall, I need to put this up. Uh, thanks Don and Social Media Breakfast for giving us this opportunity to talk with you and tell you a little bit about what's happening right here in our city. And thanks John from Caffeinated Computing for sponsoring this. So this is a lunch that goes out and actually we don't put them in brown bags anymore, but the idea is that we're brown bagging for Calgary's kids and 2,000 of these go out every day in Calgary. So we're aware of over 2,000 kids that would otherwise go without a healthy lunch. So this lunch is a nice fresh made sandwich, fruits and a fruit, a vegetable and a snack. And this gives the nutrition and the energy and the love to all these kids in Calgary that would otherwise not have this opportunity. So I'll just tell you a little story. Um, I could go on and on forever about how brown bagging it. Um, we're a great organization surrounded by lots of great people that really want to do small acts to make a huge difference for themselves, the act of doing something, and for these kids that we're feeding. Think about how you feel when you've been fed and the energy you, can, you have and to learn and grow. So we have um, about 75 community groups in Calgary that actually make the lunches around these kids and in these schools, not just at our downtown <coughs> kitchen. And uh, one of the groups is a retirement residence by Eau Claire. And we were talking with them, and as they were delivering, their, delivering the lunches to the school just north of downtown, um, one, of the, one of the young kids that gets a lunch says, comes up to this, retire, this retiree and says, I know that my lunch was made with love. And it doesn't get better than that. It's a small act, simple act, that actually makes a lifetime of a difference for these kids in Calgary. So um, thank you for what you guys do and the presence you have in our social media world. Thanks to Donna and there is lunch here for you guys today and there's some information in here um, as well. So just to learn a, bit, a little bit about brown bagging and we truly believe if you use your head, your heart and your hands you will uh, make a difference. So a small act using your head, what pulls at your heartstrings, what can you do and then actually take the action and make the difference. So I'll give you that opportunity and that challenge to see what you can do to help these kids in Calgary. So thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. So, okay, so what we're gonna what we're gonna do today is so the sponsorship dollars for breakfast today is actually going um, uh, uh, to um, brown bagging it. And if anybody, I just thought that we would throw it out there. Occasionally, we um, do support a charity with social media breakfast. So if anybody actually wants to donate a loony or a toony the um to the uh to the breakfast today that would uh to uh, brown bagging it that would be great so now i think what we'll do is we'll take a couple of minutes and we'll just um next up is um the presentation with jeff so why don't we take a couple minutes if you want to fill up your coffee and we'll um and everybody can uh, grab a uh, brown bag if they'd like okay and then we'll we'll start in like three minutes so there's guys there that will help you grab your lunch Excuse me. So just two things while we're just getting back to our seats. The first thing that both um, Tanya and I, I had made a note to to mention it and we both forgot was that they actually prepare lunches. So they do some, they have a kitchen and they actually prepare lunches for a dollar. So between donations and um, uh, discounts on food um, and managing their um, inventory really, really well, they um, in fact, when I, so that was one of the things when I called Tanya on Wednesday morning and said, any chance I can have a uh, hundred lunches for Friday morning? And she said, I don't know if we have enough in our kitchen to make a hundred lunches. And they do 2,000 a day. So that, like, they, they really, they keep their supplies low, but, but they keep their costs down really low. Um, Jeff, our speaker, has made a very kind 
um, offer that um, we've got a bucket set up if anybody wants to donate and whatever gets donated today he's going to match up to a thousand dollars so uh, that's uh, that's also very nice so we'll uh, yeah okay Jeff this is for you just so you know okay uh, oh okay just leave it at the end of the table there. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so I think we'll get going. So, Catherine, are you in the room? Oh, sorry, Catherine. Catherine is going to um, introduce Jeff. And, okay, I'll let you do that. Sorry, and I'll let you get my PowerPoint off. Good morning. Welcome, enjoy your, your breakfast. I get the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Jeff is the owner of Kahane Law Office. He is a trusted authority who regularly volunteers his time, leadership, and teaching skills to educational institutions and community enhancement organizations. Let some of his awards speak to the quality of his work. He's received the Business in Calgary Leadership of Tomorrow Award, Calgary Inc.'s Best Places to Work. I've met some of the staff, they're very happy. 2013 Top Choice Award for Best Family Law Firm in Calgary, and the 2014 Top Choice Award for Best Real Estate Law Firm in Calgary. He is also responsible for the annual scavenger hunt in the fall, kahanerace.com. Jeff captivated us last year when he joined us for number, for I think it was event number 34, where he told us about intellectual property and how it pertains, or the, how those laws pertain to the internet and social media. A fun fact about Jeff is he has one of the largest Pez collections on display in his office. I invite you to go see it, it is quite spectacular. Today, Jeff is going to be speaking to us about the anti-spam laws. Jeff Kahane, please come to the podium. Thank you. Test, test, good volume. Can everyone hear me? Good. You know, I'm very fortunate that they happen to get this on the right side today, but it also looks like me. Uh, Jeff Kahane, been doing law since 2001, and I love it. It's just the most fun, exciting thing for me every day. Uh, I don't have days where, ugh, gotta go to the office, or thank God it's Friday. Don't even understand that. Not a workaholic, though, but just enjoy what I do. And my former life before law, was um, education. I used to be a school teacher. I taught mostly grade four. Uh, feeling a little bit older since last, uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, one of my grade six students is refinancing her house. She's now an anesthetist. <laughs> so, uh, you know, feeling the age, but um, I still try and, try and teach whenever I can. I've taught at uh, UFC, I've taught real estate law, I've taught for Mount Royal State, the real estate boards, uh, the um, Real Estate Council of Alberta, uh, and it's just something that I really enjoy doing. Um, because it's fun, and so I get a, a kick out of it. Spam, and you know, I wish I had a singing voice, I'd do a little spam, 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 spam. <laughs> it, Canada has been a funny place in terms of spam, um, and I, I just wanna distinguish a couple of things, and I'm guessing some of the people here are a little social media savvy and electronic communication savvy. Spam being nasty stuff, um, such as the Nigerian, oh, I'm on the wrong page. I'm also PowerPoint in that, so I apologize. <laughs> Bad case of ADW, ADWT, attention deficit, hey, what's that, has led me to uh, <laughs> rely on tools that, have we got that up? No. Name. That's when I got Donna's going okay. Yay. Nigeria. Yes. So who here has got an email from someone who there is this guy in Nigeria, Africa, somewhere. He is the head of some government department and is able to give you millions of dollars. Now he's going to keep half but you get half of this fortune that he smuggled out of his country. Anyone, anyone? Yeah? Who's got the one where, um, you know, oh, I'm so sorry to tell you, we couldn't find any family members. You're the last person with the same name. So we've got these millions of dollars for you. Um, you know, they're yours. We just need to pay for the fees of doing the probate or whatever. Now you get them, and then, I always got that Viagra, anyone? 
get those emails. <laughs> I mean, that's what we usually think of, of as spam. And you think, like, who falls for these things? Like, who is actually doing it? But I get calls every year. I get people who say, Jeff, I, I need help. I need to send a bond, this, some kind of bond to these people overseas. And I'll ask, is this about an email you got? Yeah, you know, someone died. And, you know, and I say, does it sound a little bit like this? And I've got the whole stack of them. But yeah, yeah, that's it. I said, yeah, don't send that bond. Um, <laughs> Australia, I think, is probably the leader per capita in terms of, um, um, no, am I working on this? Did that just change? Oh, good. Um, it's probably the leader per capita. I think it's something about $36 million a year that people are being defrauded through spammy emails. That's a lot of money. The annual return that these guys are making is pretty good, and I think their cost of living is fairly low in some of these countries. Um, billions of emails every day. I mean, anyone who's been hacked and has the little where they, they add in their links for their website and embed it into your site, I mean, it, it is billions. You think, why is this a problem? It, does clogging the internet really make a difference? But it does. Even if so, after something like 9-11 where people were emailing all over the place and what's going on, people as far away as Sweden, I heard, I used to work for an international law firm um, doing international work, and I get this email from Sweden. Is something happening because their, their email is just really slow and the internet is really slow? It clogs things up. It affects business. It takes time to delete it when they come in. You've got to go through your spam filter. I mean, every day I've got to go through mine because in mixed with the ones that are caught that are spam are ones that aren't spam. You've got to go through them. And it's, it's a huge drain. Um, I wish I could see it on this screen. Do you know how to make that happen? Um, the other part is the threats. I mean, it, you know, spam coming along and changing your computer or letting, giving people in back doors or phishing for your private information. Um, I think the popular one is eBay or your online banking. We need you to update your password and information. And people do. People get these things and they go and they update all their information on things. So there, there's some serious side effects and consequences to it um, uh, that we have to be aware of. So you know, is it a good thing that the government steps in and says, hey, like we need to make a little change here. We need to do something to protect people. Yeah, I, I think we do. I think that is entirely appropriate. Um, you look at legislation. Canada is behind the ball. Japan, 2002. The States, 2003. UK, 2003. China, 2005. We're in 2014, and we don't have the spam legislation or uh, anti-spam legislation that other places do. So Canada said, hey, like, we've sucked at doing this. We are horrible. We have not, a decade has gone by and we're sitting on our hands. We're going to make the best. We're going to do the best anti-spam, anti-electronic. We are going to wrap this up and showcase to the world how good we are at winning this battle. I, I, I don't know if the approach they took was right. And we're going to go through things. And the, the anti-spam legislation, it's got a big fancy name. This is the actual name of the act. Uh, I'm not going to read it for you. Um, but it's, it's a piece of legislation that ties in three government agencies, federal agencies. It deals with um, you know, people being able to go in and change your computer or program, install a program on your computer. Like, yes, absolutely. You shouldn't be able to, without someone's consent, change their computer programming. You shouldn't be able to do that. That's not what, what I have an issue with in terms of going too far. The going too far is what I'm going to talk about mostly today is emails. So there's a big difference between emails and spam. I mean, emails are, well, we'll take it a step further. It's not just emails. This legislation captures all electronic messaging. If you tweet, you're electronic messaging. If you use LinkedIn, and I do. I've, I've, um, uh, I've been in talks with the guys out of Toronto about what is LinkedIn doing to um, ensure that we don't violate the new anti-spam legislation. Um, and they, they don't really have a solution yet. They say it's coming and it's going to be there. Um, and LinkedIn is important for me. I mean, uh, top 1% viewed profiles last year. Uh, we've got probably about a quarter million dollars in new business that comes in from LinkedIn alone. It is a very good business tool. So all those people who put on Facebook, you know, in 400 years, archaeologists will discover a purpose for LinkedIn. Well, they missed the ball. Um, any electronic 
messages that are being sent. Um, so what does it regulate? Sending electronic messages without consent, uh, altering data, and again, we're going to focus on the top one. Uh, we talked about some of these other uh, aspects of the legislation uh, because that is what's going to affect people um, most. China has the death penalty, I've been told. I don't study China law. <laughs> and, and I should throw in that lawyer caveat. The information today is information purposes only. If you have specific questions about your specific situation, make sure you call us with legal pits. Um, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, China has some very tough rules for spammers. China is you know, second leader in the world in terms of delivering spam. You know, the United States, they've had spam legislation for over a decade. They are out of control with their, the spam that comes out of the States, mostly um, for um, medication, you know, people buying medication for cheap or, or um, uh, pornography, uh, a lot of medication stuff. Um, so the concern that I have and the concern that's been expressed more widely is who's the new law going to catch? Is it going to catch these people who are sending all this spam, especially when most of them are out of country? I mean, the answer is no. It's not going to do iota of difference. Is it going to catch the small business person who um, has a, a um, newsletter they send out once a month to promote their business? Yes. And so it, th that is why it's important for people to be aware because that's who's going to end up being caught. And you know, if anyone runs their own business or deals with uh, other businesses who are doing newsletters, because who doesn't? Sending an electronic newsletter is easy, it's cheap, uh, it keeps you top of mind. I mean, there's a lot of really good reasons to. Which brings me into why we have to keep it serious, to, uh, take it seriously. Because it is regulating electronic messages. It's not just dealing with spam. Three federal agencies. So it's not like you just have the cops who are enforcing this. You've got the CRTC, you've got privacy legislation, you've got three federal government bodies that are enforcing it. The fine potentials are huge, we'll talk about them, but we're, we're talking for a company up to $10 million a day, um, for individuals up to a million dollars a day. Uh, I think it's $200 per email per day. And this last one is one that scares me the most of all. You hear about groups of people who like to, they kind of live on the fringe of society and they try and figure ways of living in society without actually contributing to society. So it comes to mind, I think, free men on the land, no offense if anyone's here, but you know, if you're your own sovereign nation you don't, and you don't have a passport and permission to be here, then go back to your nation where you're sovereign of. Um, but some of these people are going to grasp this. Private prosecution means that if someone rear ends me, I'm not relying on the government to, to take my case to court and get me damages. I've got to do that. Privately, I've got to either hire a lawyer, represent myself, and sue. Private prosecution means that individuals will be able to sue you or your company if you um, send them spam. Again, up to $200 a day. So if you have people who are sort of living on that fringe, this is going to be a very opportunistic um, chance for them. Now, fortunately, uh, when, they, when they talked about putting in the new legislation, I think the timeline is next? Um, no. Uh, they would give us lots of time, but they don't. The private prosecutions, we've got about three years, so we've got to, we don't have to freak out entirely about that. Um, but again, it just it catches so much. Spams, blogs, tweets, all that stuff. Um, they announced it December 4th, July 1st, this coming July. We've got to be on the ball. So anything you send out after July 1st or on July 1st, you are caught under the legislation. Um, and the problem with the law is people make the laws. It takes a long time for those laws to be set out. Technology changes very, very quickly with new ways of communicating. So not only does it take a long time for them to enact laws, but then we have to try and understand them. And to understand them, the best way is for someone to get mad and sue someone else and the court say, ah, this is how we interpret that law. So it could take a very, very long time. It took you know, probably eight, 10 years for the courts to say, you know, what is an original, what's a duplicate? Is microfiche compared to uh, an electronic copy, compared to a signed original, compared to a photocopy, to differentiate all those different meanings? And the same thing, we're gonna see problems um, with the legislation because we're not gonna know exactly what it means as the courts try and interpret it to say, have we gone too far? Does this interfere with freedom of speech? Is there gonna be 
uh, bigger problems. Um, they, they have tried to be helpful. There are information bulletins, and at the end I've got some links to um, some websites for more information. So the government has information bulletins that help us to understand better um, what they want us to think they, they mean with their legislation, but they've only had two so far, and this is just approaching so fast. I think we're gonna, um, we, we need more. We need more understanding. IT dependent. Um, so the cost, talk about small businesses. The cost on small businesses in terms of complying is gonna be hard. We're gonna talk about what you need in terms of consent, but you, to be able to um, make sure that you are compliant is gonna need um, some software and databases and whatnot. Um, uh, enforcement, huge issues. We talked about three agencies. Um, it, it is something that is a real thing that we have to f focus with. Past stuff doesn't really matter. Royal Sent, just law stuff. You know, the law comes into effect in July. Um, there is an extension for, now again, computer programs. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them today, so, but it, there is a different deadline for that. Private right of action, July 1st, 2017 and implied consent expiring 2017. I'm gonna talk about implied consent and express consent uh, in just a second, but um, those dates are, are important. Does it apply to you? Who uses email? Who uses email for business? Who sends any electronic uh, messages for business in their business? Um, it applies to everyone, like, there, there is no question. It is going to apply to almost every individual and every company in, in Canada um, for sure. The threshold, so how do you know if you're caught? Is it a commercial electronic message? What is a commercial electronic message? One is an electronic message. I think we know what that is. If you wrote it on a piece of paper, you put a stamp on it, you popped it in the mailbox, not a commercial message. If you use the keyboard and push send, it is a commercial message. Uh, is it commercial? Um, Um, so is it, is it a, a, sorry, electronic message, just a step back. Um, hyperlinks, connections, it, commercial, me uh, electric, electronic message is any message that's sent electronically. They're all gonna be caught. Um, um, and if any of the purposes involves a commercial activity, it's gonna get caught. Look at charities. Charities have an exemption for fundraising. So if they are fundraising and asking for dollars, they are exempted from this legislation. If they are having a gala, that promotes their business, it looks like they are being caught by the legislation. Um, and commercial activities, it, it's very, very broad. So if there's any commercial character in it, and it doesn't matter if there's an expectation of profit. So not-for-profits you know, aren't exempted. Um, a, uh, community, uh, uh, a community organization that ranges soccer or something, these can all get caught uh, it, again, unless someone has official charitable status where they have charitable receipts, then you have some exemptions, but that's it. So what do you need to have? If you're going to send out electronic messages under the new um, legislation, you need consent, you need um, certain information included, and you need an unsubscribe uh, feature. We're going to get into the details on those. So consent, originally, or initially we're going to be implied or express consent. Um, the onus is on the sender to prove it. So that means is you, as a sender of an electronic message, are required to prove that you had someone's consent. If you get um, an email from someone that says you have my consent, then you have to save it. Because 30 years from now, under this law, you're still required to prove it. If you have oral consent, we're going to get through some of this too, there are also very um, um, set rules for what you have to do. You have to prove it, not someone else. It's not, it's not like a reverse onus where you know, innocent to prove and guilty. You have to prove that you have consent. Opt-outs, not allowed. So you can't send something that says, if you don't want to get my newsletter, let me know. You can't do it. They have to send you, we want to be part of your newsletter database. And if you had consent from uh, two years ago or a year ago or six months ago that they said, yes, I want to get your, your um, newsletters, no good under the new legislation. You need to get fresh consent for um, sending out information. Has it gone too far? Yeah. Um, um, when you get consent, if you get consent for a newsletter and they say, yes, I want your newsletter, you do that right, 
and then you send them an offer for something. Oh, you know, this week only, $200 off a will. Um, not okay. Like you have to have, in, in the consent, it has to be very specific as to what you're going to be doing. And it can't be hidden, it can't be part of the fine print. Go, go one step further, you can't toggle. If you send them um, an invoice that says, thank you for your order, we've done business, here's your, you know, we acknowledge receiving your $10, your product's on the way, and with a little pre-checked check mark, I want you to send me your newsletter, doesn't count. So, they, I mean, it's express consent, it is them not opting out, but if the check mark is pre-toggled um, yes, you got a problem with that. CRTC, so because we have three different um, regulatory bodies that are involved here, the rules are, you know, they're, they're in one piece of legislation, but they're kind of all over the place also. Um, so oral consent, you have two choices. Someone says, if we're here and, and you say, Jeff, I want you to send me your newsletter, I'm gonna say, that's great, but I either need to have an independent third party who's acknowledging it, um, and, and you get this sometimes with, with uh, on uh, phone, selling companies where they say, let me put you through this third party and they then go through everything and you give consent. Or it has to be complete unedited recording and it has to be retained because remember the onus is on you. You have it for a year, it's in your system. Three years later they said, well I never gave consent. You said, well yes you did. I had it recorded but I erased it. Makes it very hard to prove that you had, because the onus is on you to, to prove it. Um, um, it can be in writing, so if you have clients come in, you're a paper, uh, brick and mortar store, people can sign something that gives consent, no problem. It can be electronic, but you have to again save the electronics and as time goes on, if you change your email system, or whatever system you have for recording it and you can no longer get access to that information, you're going to have a problem for, for approving the consent. Um, time, date, purpose, manner of consent, got to record everything. Information. So the information in your consent piece, it's, it's got to be very clear. No fine print. It's got to be very, very obvious what you're doing. Um, you've got to identify who you are. It can't be one of these blind things or no one really knows who's sending it. Um, but the, the specific person who's sending it. There has to be contact information including a physical address. So it has to be a physical address and the uh, recipient, the person who gets it, has to have a clear unsubscribe mechanism. So on all emails, we should be looking at now changing in the next month, so we have a month and a half, so we have a right to unsubscribe so that you, you um, have that built into what you're sending out. Unsubscribe, again, very clear, easy to find, uh, discernible, easy to use. If someone opts out, you've got 10 days. If you ignore it, you get caught under the act. Um, the mechanism for unsubscribing has to remain active for 60 days. So if you send it and then, um, you know, two weeks later they send, I want to click out, um, it, it's got it's to stay active for 60 days. Um, no cost, so you can't charge them for, for withdrawing consent, which would be a great trick if you could do that one. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, sorry, it clear, it's got to be clear. They have some rules in their interpretation bulletin about text, so you'll see a number of um, large organizations that send you regular te text, so I think, like, like who uses a red box for movies or President's Choice where they'll say uh, text stop to stop it. So because you're limited on characters, there's less um, there, and they're saying that that is an acceptable way, but it does, it is in, uh, caught by everything this act. Transition period. So. Existing relationships, one where you already have an ongoing business, you've got um, clients that have used you for 10 years. In the first three years, you don't need to get express consent. You can use implied consent. Um, once July 1st, 2017 comes around, all those people that you're relying on uh, implied consent, so existing clients, you need to have their, their express consent to send them commercial messages. And you know, express and implied consent is something that lawyers use all the time, so just very, very briefly. Uh, implied consent is you're, you're, you don't have, someone hasn't specifically said, I give you consent. Um, it's implied by something, by someone's action, by somebody's, um, you know, what they've done, what they've sent you, um, versus express, which is very, very clear in orally or in writing or electronically that they give you consent. 
existing business relationships. So they've gone so far as to tell us what an existing, and this is for the implied consent. So this only gets you for the first three years, what that means. Um, if you've sold or traded anything in the last two years, if there is um, 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 acceptance of a business uh, uh, or an opportunity. So something has, someone has, you've sent someone an email and they've said yes, you know, I'd like that. So it's, you haven't actually traded something, but they've accepted something in the, in the last two years. Um, if there was um, written contracts, so something in place already that established a relationship in the last two years, um, leasing products or goods or services. It's something that you've done business. Whatever your regular course of business is, you've engaged with that person over the last two years. Um, so it's there. Uh, Non-business relationships. So again, you know, it's funny politicians, how they work. So I have a friend, he's a politician here in Alberta. And he says, Jeff, are politicians exempted? Because the, the no phone <laughs> list, they're exempted from that. I said, yeah, you're exempted because you're a politician. Oh, phew. Anyway, about the hockey game. I just don't care anymore. So politicians, completely exempt from, from this, they can text, tweets, email, all they want. Um, um, relationships, so where it's uh, not commercial, so it's not a business relationship, but you have a pre-existing personal relationship, you can still have that, that as implied consent, again, only for the first three years. Um, other exemptions, law enforcement, public safety, you know, family, so you send an email to your sister, it's fine. Question? Yeah. What about government or non-profits? So not-for-profits, charities, or, pardon? Not and not for. Not, so, so, you know, not-for-profits is a funny thing, and people uh, equate not-for-profit with charity, which is not always the same thing. Charity is registered charity, is a charitable organization under the tax laws. Uh, not-for-profit just means um, that you're not looking to have a profit, but you're also not looking to have a loss. Um, so they do, they do fall into legislation. Government, it's going to depend on the nature of government. So, you know, politicians, again, not included. Um, um, safety stuff, so if the police have an amber warning, it, it would appear that that wouldn't be in, caught by the legislation. But if you have a city park and rec league, um, it may. So it's, it, a lot of it we don't have specifics for because they've only set out some of the rules. But, it, I mean, good question. It's part of what we're going to have to... So if the email is not commercial, it's not profit. Commercial, it, it doesn't matter if there's an expectation of profit. So that's one of the, one of the things that's important here. If it, is, if it is commercial in nature, so if it's engaging someone in what you do, um, it doesn't matter if you are trying to earn money from them. It could be a come out to our free barbecue. So it's in, because part of that, if there's any kind of engagement that would stem for that or a reasonable expectation that there would be um, something that stems from it. So if I, if I have a wine and cheese at the office and say everyone's invited to wine and cheese at the office, I mean, really what I'm doing it for is to get people to know our business and get to know us a little bit and you know, eventually get work from it. It's not the express con uh, um, purpose of that email, but bigger picture it is. So you, you just got to be careful with those specifics. And, and Unfortunately, we don't have all the answers because the rules just kind of popped up about four months ago and they're being imp implemented right away. So some of it, well, we can go through the specific details, um, but some of it we're just not going to know until someone gives us more information. One other question about the implied consent. Yeah. So if you have a mailing list and you don't, you've been emailing them for years, and then you don't have a So th there's two parts of that. So the questions, in case people couldn't hear, so implied consent, if you've been emailing a list of people for years, and um, so now on July 1st, does that count for implied consent even if you don't have a record of it? And, and I would say it depends. You know, lawyer's favorite word, you know, probably. Um, in every law school exam, the word probably is the single most used word that you have other than the. Um, um, so the law is looking at, have you had a previous business relationship? Is there complied consent? If I, was sending, uh, if I was sending out emails to my previous clients, so anyone who's done business with me in the last 10 years and I send them emails all the time, um, then, well, I'd say in the last two years, because they have that two years, I'd say no problem. Like there's, like, uh, there's not going to be an issue with implied consent, if, and depending on the nature of what your business is. So if you've just been sending newsletters and there hasn't been a business relationship where you have that consent, then, you know, maybe. And again, the, the law says that unless there's some kind of implied consent because there's, there's and they've set out the things, and there's, there's a few more. Um, 
So you'd have to see if it gets caught in those exemptions uh, for implied consent. But really, you need to start the process of building your express consent right now because three years seems like a long time, but it's not. And the fact that we only have a few months to start right away is, uh, is problematic. Yeah. Sorry, and, and some of this, there isn't an exact answer because we just don't know yet. So again, the question is, and um, you should start seeing this if you haven't already, existing newsletter subscribers where they say uh, to continue receiving our very informative, fantastic yes. newsletter, uh, please give us your actual consent. Yeah, that is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Asking for consent if you don't fall under an exemption or there's no implied consent after July 1st, you're done, you're caught. You got to remove them. So, so the old consents do not count under the new legislation. Yeah, so old consents are, are not valid anymore. You could argue that you have implied consent um, because. Um, you have implied consent because they have already consented and it's been gone going and they haven't opted out. There's been an opt out mechanism. So you can imply this consent, but it's then you, you still only have three years. Because after that, it doesn't matter how long. They could have been a subscriber for 20 years, tell you every month how much they love it, keep it, well, keep it going is okay. If they're just saying, you know, I love it, this is great, you're not having that express consent. I saw a question on the side. Yep. It's express consent prior to, but anything, you gotta redo the whole thing. And we're in the same boat with our database. We're on constant contact and- um, I hate them by the way, but- Well, it's, you know, whether it's SurveyMonkey or constant contact, yeah. And, and you know, it's my issue with, with um, LinkedIn. I said, guys, like, you, we fall under this trap. Like, who's ever tried to unsubscribe from Facebook or, you know, any of the social media? I mean, they hide that sucker, like there's no tomorrow. So, I mean, part of the rules, and we'll look just briefly about social media, it has to be an easy way for the person to opt out. There's not really an easy way for a person to opt out. Now, arguably, if you're just posting stuff, that, that probably would not get caught, but if you're sending a direct message, under legislation, it would. Yeah. What about in a scenario where you're kind of interacting with like a third party to get the message out? Like, for instance, Kickstarter. So you get a bunch of people who back you, and now you're emailing them updates regarding the product that consent already built in, and is that something Kickstarter worries about? Well, no, because you're, if you're using a third party, so it's, it's not just if you send it, but if you cause it to be sent. So you do get caught under there, and we've got a, a couple slides about that, but you, you do, there, uh, even directors, again, I'm getting ahead of myself, the ADD, um, squirrel. Um, <laughs> if you have um, uh, employees that work under you, and you're a director or officer, you can have liability for what your employees do. So, I mean, that's, that's huge, you know. For, um, the, the company can be liable for what the employees are doing. So someone on their work email sends out, you know, to all their contacts, because you, you develop friendships and stuff with your colleagues that you, you know, people who are buying products and service from you, say, oh, my son's in this, and, you know, would anyone be interested in, well, donating, if it's not charity, you're caught, or I'm having a, tea light party or I don't know all the parties that are happening right now but you know <laughs> some yummy sushi house party you can buy sushi from my friends if you send those out from your work um, email you could get caught and the employers could be liable so we're going to talk about ways of avoiding some of these um, problems oh yeah question <laughs> Yeah, so you're, you're, um, it, it is individual consent. Um, if the, the employer gives consent, um, yeah, it's, it's all individual. So now, 
if you're in the course of a business of relationships, I mean, there's, there, again, implied is one thing because you, I mean, you send emails every day long, all day long, and that's the problem with the legislation. If I send you an email saying, you know, just, just a reminder, let's say I'm a mortgage broker, reminder, your, your mortgage is going to expire, your, you know, we did your last one three years ago, and you'll get a much better rate if we renegotiate it versus, you know, heads up, you get caught. It's under it. You know, it's not just where you randomly pick someone, a stranger, and send them an email. Hey, you have a mortgage because you own a home, so it, it, it gets both of them. So, so the question is retweeting. So if someone follow, uh, forwards something that you've already, that you've sent them, and you have consent with that person, then you're not sending it. You're not directing them to send it. If you said, hey, everyone, we're doing a campaign. I need you, 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 you to send out all these emails to everyone, a little bit different. But someone is forwarding it on their own. And if they're forwarding it, it's for information. It's not, it probably wouldn't get caught. Probably, yeah, thank you. Um, because, um, their purpose isn't to build, you know, it's not a commercial message for them. There's no expectation of, like, of any transaction. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what happens with it. Um, because, you know, whenever they make rules, and this is why the Tax Act gets updated twice a year instead of once a year like everything else, because when you have rules that are important like this, people find loopholes. I mean, that's what they do. But there is, there, I mean, there is a best defense, and we're going we're gonna to get to this part at the end. The, I mean, the best defense is due diligence, so what we'll talk about soon. I don't, let me just check. Are we time? Are we going to have time? I have till half past, right? 40 after? Just, uh, just so you know, if you have to leave, um, feel free. And yeah, if you would, about 20, 20 after okay. or so. Okay, so, I, and I don't know how to manage this because I hate not answering questions. Mm -hmm. Let's do a couple more and then we'll keep going and we'll have time at the end for questions. Yeah. Just a question on your slides and stuff. Will they be available to actually have a look at at some point? Or your yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, 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 we're going to put out some blogs on it, and we're going to do, um, if you have, for legal stuff, we have a YouTube channel, uh, kahanelaw.com slash YouTube, or sorry, backwards, youtube.com slash kahanelaw, and they're all under two minutes. I'd like to think they're not entirely boring, um, and they're just, they, we've got 120 videos out every Thursday, Friday, we put out a new one. We've had about 22,000 views so far, so, you know, people seem to like them. Um, but we are going to launch a few more on, on this one right away. Yeah. One question. Who, what's the penalty and who's policing it? Oh, penalties we're going to get to, and that's a, that's a doozy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the scenario is a blogger, RSS feed, goes through constant contact, Matt, Mimi, whoever, and sends out an email notifying the subscriber that there is a new post. They're following it via an RSS feed. How do you manage that because you can't? If they're following, so again, if it's just a, a if it's a general post and you're not directing, sending out, communicating, then you should be okay. Like, like, like if you post, like Facebook, you can just put a, a general post where you're not messaging someone directly. Right. That's different. If their system they have set up where they get an up, so my phone, you know, I get a tweet and say, oh, I got a tweet. Um, sorry, that's a bad example. I have an update, you know, someone has said something different than if you are sending out directly to them. So, so two separate things. And I'm going to do one more question just because I think your arm's going to fall off. Yeah. You, you need your specific, so at your booth at the bridal fair, you should have your own sheet for um, getting consent. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's specific consent and for specifically what you're sending out for. So it can't just be general. Um, sorry guys, we'll do more questions after. <laughs> um, otherwise we just won't get through it all. Uh, exemptions. So there are some exemptions where um, that you can follow, and exemptions. Exemptions are there, but don't try and focus on exemptions because this is not about a general thing. It's each and every email, each and every one that you send. You've got to look at does this email fall under an exemption, not to this person. So 
um, where there's relationships, where there's acti you know, emails about um, the activities of, the, relation of uh, the organization, so specifics. If someone sends you an email out of the blue and says, hey, can you give me a quote to fix my roof? You're okay to respond to them because um, they've asked for you to send it to them, but you can't put them then on your email list. It's very specific. Um, and uh, generally speaking, it only accounts to the first response back. So, and that's where you think more things get caught. Um, uh, judicial orders. So sometimes we can't find someone and you can't just serve them in person. Hey, you've been served. It makes all good fancy TV. Sometimes we have to do it by, uh, by other means. And we have served people via Facebook. So you're okay doing service, you're, you're, anything judicial. I mean, the courts can order what they want. And this is just one more of those things. Um, um, messages from the bank. So if there's, if there's specific things that your bank, they haven't got specific consent for, but there is a security issue or like for real, you've got to change your passport because it's really your bank and not some fisher. Um, um, the banks can do that. If you send out an email to someone else, so someone lives in um, the states and you send them an email, so as long as you are uh, complying with that state's laws, you're okay. So it's, it's, the recipient has to be in Canada for the castle, we call it, like the new Canadian um, span legislation. Um, and, and because Canada is more stringent than anywhere else, you'll probably be okay, but don't send those mass market because most, most countries don't allow that to happen. Fundraisers, again, primary fundraising purpose, asking for money. So fun, uh, charities have to be very careful with this one. And again, political parties, enough said, they, they can do what they want. Um, consent again, uh, responses to uh, quotes or estimates, uh, a message that facilitates. So if you have a commercial transaction with someone, they have a contract with you, and as part of that contract you're required to do something, then that's going to be okay. You have a question? Probably not, because it's someone who's m messaging you, requesting a quote, which is different from, hey, does anybody know, right? So if someone were to, let's say we're past the three years, no implied consent, someone puts a post on Facebook, does anyone know a carpenter? And you have a carpenter, you know, th I'd say there's a difference between posting in the feed that's general versus you then direct messaging them. And usually what I'll do, just because of the confidential nature of law, is I will personally message someone in those situations, but I'm going to have to be careful with that going forward. Because you need to prove um, that their was directed to you, not general to the world. Exactly. Yeah. So these Again, like there's, there's going to have to be some mass changes, and the problem is, is that Canada is not a huge market compared to the United States or the rest of the world. So I don't know how social media is going to respond. I said LinkedIn, um, I, because I, I have direct people I can talk to there, say they're going to be in place, that everything's going to be okay, but I, I haven't seen it yet or heard what, they're, what it is that they're going to do exactly. No, but, but you do have to be very, very careful. Each specific message you send out, you've got to be conscious. Is there a, a commercial purpose behind this? Is there a reasonable expectation of a commercial purpose? It's there always is. Yeah. So for a message that's completing a contract, um, say, do you need to have in that contract written in, we will send you these messages? This suggests no. Yeah, so this suggests no. Okay. If it's part of the normal process of things, so, yeah. um, you know, I hire a guy to um, measure a house. Give me the, the, the floor plans, square footage, um, sign a little contract with him, or, or electronically sign a contract. Yeah. Don't have it. He sends me an email back that has the floor plans. It's not going to be a problem. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't matter because, like, we, like, I've worked at a construction company, so I don't even know what's included in all of their contracts with, like, whoever's on the job. But each of those things, does that have to say within there? Like, as part of this contract, we will be sending you yeah. this. Yeah. No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to catch that. Okay. Um, in for the the messages. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going so we can get through. Sorry. Um, warranty information, product recalls. So you've bought something. Sears sold you an oven. Um, the oven is recalled, they don't have your sp uh, express consent to send you something. If you use it at 220 degrees for 28 minutes, it's going to explode. They can send you an email. 
<laughs> um, factual information, so again, ongoing purchase, so ongoing um, 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 relationships where someone has a contract to buy stuff from you continuously, um, employment benefits, the things that are not looking to build new business that's all existing, I mean, that's basically where these exemptions have come from, um, ongoing existing relationships that commercially make sense to continue. So this one is exemption to consent, but not an exemption to the unsubscribe and the information, what you have to have in your email. And everybody should be changing their email. I mean, I'm bad, it's Cobbler Sun has no shoes. Uh, I, I comply with lots of my emails, but I still have to update um, my email um, that I send out. Um, but these are just exempt um, um, exemptions from the consent rules only, just the consent. Um, so if someone has a published email, you go on someone's website, there is their email address, they s and they are very specific, it's, it's obvious, then there is an exemption to be able to do that, send them an email, but that, again, just consent. They have to be able to opt out, they have to be able to get out. You can't grab it and throw it into your newsletter database. Um, and I understand that there are spiders that go and grab all these things and then automatically send them out. Uh, so there's, there's some caution there. Um, someone who discloses electronic uh, um, in, in a, um, their email address. So you get in something, it's in writing, uh, they have, you know, for more information or, you know, there's, a, again, they are putting out there that it's okay. There's an exemption from just the consent. Um, a message of referral. So, Catherine, I say, Catherine, um, I really need a client for this. Or she says, Jeff, I've got a friend, they're going through a nasty divorce, can you get in touch with them? I send an email to that friend and that friend um, then gives consent. That is okay to send that first one email, but anything after that, again, I can't add to a database, I can't send them a second one saying, you know, didn't hear back from you, just wanted to follow up, can't do that. Social media, so, um, and here's where the problem is, because we don't have an opportunity to change what mechanisms social media have. You know, in terms of opting out, um, having conspicuous mechanism for getting off of it, no social media has an easy way of, of opting out. Um, you can block people, um, but again, not conspicuous, not easy. And it's going to be interesting to see what social media is going to do. And you know, the courts are not dumb. You know, as much as sometimes people don't like decisions that courts come out with, they're not dumb and they're not out to cause problems in the world. And if people are using it, probably will be okay. If it's not being amused, you know, someone just sends a message to someone, you're inviting your friends to a tea light party, and it's not like a commercial, well, even that one might be pushing it a little bit. Um, so, I mean, the courts won't necessarily do it. They're focusing on, um, the courts focus on what makes sense, and they're ultimately the ones who are gonna be making these decisions of, yes, this is caught, no, this is not caught. Um, you know, for years, for electronic signatures, so there's a lot of controversy for real estate. Real estate, there's a rule from the 1800s that say, Real estate transactions have to be in writing. Anything that deals with land, land, wills, enduring power of attorneys, there's certain things that the government a long time ago said, these are so important that we need them to be in writing. Alberta comes up with legislation, the Electronic Transactions Act, that says that anything that has to be in writing is okay to be digital, electronic. Great, but then they have exemptions and they list out all those things from this 1800 document, so arguably not. So realtors, every time they use their iPads to, send, to have people sign on, or they take a picture of the singer and do that. Like, there's a lot of different ways of doing it electronically. The question becomes, for that contract, is it in writing if it's done electronically in any way? If it's sent by email? And for years, there was no case law. We have, now have maybe one or two cases that are very specific to certain situations. Um, it takes a long time for the law to catch up with, uh, with things. Um, the scary parts, and these are the scary parts. Um, the you know, private actions, that scares me because that gives motivation to anyone who's got a grudge to pursue something because they can put some money in their pocket. Class actions, if, and these are gonna be directed at the bigger companies that are sending out hundreds and hundreds of, of spam, spam emails. But again, it's called spam legislation, 
but it's electronic messages, email legislation, think of it in those terms. Um, there's a reporting center, there's three government bodies, there's the risk of having to defend, the cost of having to defend and deal with things. Um, extended liabilities for officers and directors. There's some really big consequences that come up. Um, penalties, penalties up to $200 per email per day. Now again, if you're sending out one or two, not a big deal, but if you're one of these companies that are sending out 100 newsletters, 1,000 newsletters, 5,000 newsletters, there's some problems. I met with a fellow last night who runs a company that for realtors sends out their newsletters. They publish them, they got the ghostwriters, they put them all together, they send them out. There's gonna be some big problems because that's, that's an industry where they send a lot of uh, newsletters out. And people like them, but when someone sends you an email saying to continue this, click yes, um, most people just ignore it, just delete. Because there's just so much email that comes through because of the spam, which you know, makes sense that we're doing something to control it, but problems. A um, million dollars for up to a million dollars per violation for an individual, 10 million for a company. It's huge, huge, huge penalties. Um, so extended liability, and this goes back to the question that you're having someone do it for you. So it extends to any person who acts, induces, or procures a prohibited act. So if you pay someone to do this for you, you can be held liable. Um, Officers and directors, if you're directing your employees of the company um, to, to even allow, so it's not just you're directing them, but you're allowing it to go through, you're caught uh, um, and are, are, uh, uh, have liability. Uh, employers, for acts of their employees, acting within the scope of authority. So if someone's doing something completely not allowed, that's one thing, um, but if part of their business, then the employer gets in. Now, this is an important one, due diligence. So the due diligence part of this legislation, I like. And the reason I like it is because it is very, very clear and very helpful. And this is the part that everyone in this room, everyone who has a small business that uses any kind of electronic communication um, needs to really focus on immediately. Like right away, you just gotta start working on, working on it. Um, so if you can prove, if you're able to demonstrate your organization has taken proactive steps to comply with the legislation, the law, the, the law is, I'm gonna get in your way for a second, must not. So lawyers are paying the ass because we look at what lured words are used. Am I allowed to say that? I apologize. Um, we look at specific words. I'm at Humpty's and it says, you know, they're missing a comma and it's toast, hash browns, or this. And I'm like, okay, well this literally, I'm supposed to get all three of these and they've really screwed that up and no, it's not their intent, but it's how we read things. You're reading a contract. So must not must not. So this is not arguing. Person, if they have a due diligence defense under here, they must not be found guilty. That is good. Um, you know, a person uh, in uh, section 54, a person must not be found to have committed a convention of uh, the legislation if they have established that they exec exercise due diligence to prevent a controversy. Um, so what does that mean? We've got five steps. One, do an audit. Take a look at what you're doing. Identify your electronic messages that you're sending out as a company, as a business, as an organization, as an individual, uh, if you're self-employed especially. Um, list them out because remember, it's not um, a broad thing. It's each and every piece of something that you push send on, every, individually. Step two. Put in policies. So if you're working with a company or organization or your company services companies or organizations, um, you, you need to put policies in place. You need to have them in writing, have each employee sign off on them so that they acknowledge they've read it, have training. So, I mean, and it, it sounds all big and fancy, but you know, training doesn't, it just means someone sits down and explains to everyone, okay, don't do this anymore, it's bad. Um, you've got to train your staff. Um, have a statement, so have, instead of a mission statement, but just a, a anti-spam legislation statement that everyone's aware of in your company, um, and update privacy policies. Privacy policies people have relied on for a long time, they've been important, they've been in place, they still are because that law hasn't gone away, but um, put it in your privacy policies so, so you can show that you've had due diligence and then you must not be held liable. Getting consents. So, Getting those consents right away. Our time is short. And 
the, the, the unfortunate part when they announced in January or was December, in the new year, um, that we had only a short time frame to start complying is that then people started scrambling, but not even in terms of, of the um, um, learning part. It's like, oh, we better find out about this. And then you have to go into step two of what are we going to do about it. Um, small firms, so big law firms, and my firm is a small firm. We've got nine lawyers. Um, we're not a huge downtown law firm. You know, someone says, are you a boutique? Yeah, we're not really a boutique. We're bigger than, like, we do more than one area of law, but we, we're, we're smaller. A big national or international law firm can pay to have, and, you know, I went to one seminar, I was talking to a fellow there. Their firm, they have two full-time people in IT. They've got three lawyers. They've got outside consultants working on how are we going to track this? What mechanism can we put in place where people can automatically, they can click, yes, I want this directly, and then record it and keep that so they have a record of it. Um, and I'm not a programmer, I'm not an IT guy, I'm not a database management person. Um, I'm the person that says, oh, well, we need this program to just do this, just make it happen. And then you find out, well, it's not just, you can't just put a button there, there's some stuff that goes on behind. Um, there, there is some serious cost to building IT solutions for recording all this. Um, so if you don't have those resources, figure out what you're going to do. I mean, what we're going to do as a firm, we have to, we're required by the Law Society to have a client um, identification form where we get everyone's, you know, their two pieces of ID, date of birth, their employer, and we are going to put a statement in there with a checkbox for them to initial if they want it. And then we've got a paper, and I know it's not very, um, um, uh, easy to navigate or use. We have to figure out what we're going to do with it next. Probably some kind of OCR software. We're, we're working on that. Uh, but we need to be able to prove that that we have got consent from someone. Um, forms, like using your forms, uh, making sure you have the unsubscribe stuff on all your emails. There should be an ability for someone to say, don't. And if you're just sending emails, you know, someone says, don't send me emails anymore. Okay, I'm not going to send them email. But you got to remember, you can't accidentally do it afterwards. Um, Record keeping, so keep, like keeping track of it. You've got to get those all uh, in place. Oh, yeah. Just to quickly ask, with that, because you are now taking um, their personal information and trying to store it, is it the seven or ten year um, storage on that? We're required to keep our documents for ten years. Different industries seem to have different requirements, but, but lawyers, I think it's a little bit longer than, than others. Um, uh, and, and you have to follow your privacy rules for, for it also. So you're keeping idea. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, and, but if you're required to keep information, I'm required to keep information for 10 years for a file, for, for a transaction, for a matter that we work for a client. Arguably, for the, under the legislation, if in 11 years someone says, well, prove that you had consent and I can't prove it because I've shredded it, I'm going to have a problem. So arguably, this is the problem with, with the legislation, because as technology changes, if you digitalize your consent monitoring process, you're, you're going to have some issues. Yeah? So um, I'm in with a 200-person company, so we're dropping 10,000 this summer to turn around and hold all this stuff. We've been offering it for about a year and a half, but I'm also on a nonprofit board, and we've been looking at, for that one, to use SurveyMonkey to turn around and just have people go over there and sign off on that and then take that and put it in Dropbox. Is that going to be enough? So, so the question is, if I understand it right, yeah. and so everyone can hear, yeah. can you use a third-party company like SurveyMonkey to send out a request for um, consent, express consent to something? And there's, there's no real problem with that because you can show you've got express consent um, as long as you can maintain that record okay. of that consent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, one more question there. No, as long as you have access to it. Okay. So, so is, you know, but you know, constant contact gets bought out by another company. They don't have that anymore. That's, but it, I mean, I don't know what the chances are of that. And I, I have to apologize because I don't use those database systems myself, so I don't know all the ins and outs of each one specifically. Um, but as long as it's available, then you're okay because they have expressed consent. It's gone there. It's after the implementation implementation of the legislation, so you're okay. Um, but you've got to you've you've got to maintain it.
Verbal is okay, but the rules on verbal is that it has to be either be confirmed by a third party, okay? So unless you have a mechanism right there, or you have to maintain a recording of that consent. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's, a, it's a problem. So retail, you're probably better off having them sign something physically if you know. Well, uh, that now, but, well, that's only been the last two weeks. So previous to that, it was, yeah, sure. Any, and your yeah. previous stuff, you need to get, uh, you know, you can argue implied consent um, because they've had an existing relationship, they've been in our store, blah, blah, blah. But after the fact, um, after uh, 2017, July 1st, then you have to have that uh, express consent. I'm just going to rush, run through the end. We're getting close to the end here, and I know we're running out of time. Um, providing the required information. So this is stuff that's going to be in every one of your emails or messages that you send out. And again, the problem with um, um, text is you don't have enough space. Twitter, you don't have enough space. So they, they address the text part by saying stop as having a, a, being a mechanism. Um, um, unsubscribe, that's going to be the important one. Um, and the unsubscribe mechanism, making sure that you listen. You know, if someone has to send it to you twice, you got a problem. You got 10 days to unsubscribe them. Keeping records of the unsubscribe so that you can say, you know, we took this person off. Um, the legislation, this is where the problem is. It makes sense if you're looking at spam. Absolutely, like the, these rules around spam make sense. Someone who is sending out a thousand emails, I get, someone has scooped um, employees that don't even work in my law firm. Do I have my email set up? If, if I'm doing a presentation today, or if I, in fact, I happen to be doing a presentation today, <laughs> and I said, send me an email at spam at kahanelaw.com, it'll come to me. If I say, send me an email to Kahane, uh, spam socks at kahanelaw.com, anything, other than direct email at the firm, will come to me. So what someone has done is they've made up names at kahanelaw.com, people who have never ever worked at the firm, there's never been those email address. I get them, and they've been selling this, for, uh, this database company's been selling it out, so I get from legitimate companies, the Banff Arts Council, um, you know, like IBM, from not just spammy companies, but they're sending them all this crap, and it doesn't matter how many times I've asked them to take me off the list, some of them don't. Um, you know, that stuff, yeah, capture that stuff. Like, like, we don't need that. But an email where you send an email, you say, oh, there's a new uh, business down the street, we can really help them with their needs and we're gonna be a better cost, and it's really easy. Send an email, caught. Uh oh, I'm getting, either I'm supposed to hula dance, or, uh, <laughs> um, now, you know, there's a, there's a little expression. The best time to plant a cherry tree is like, or apple tree is like 25 years ago. The next best time to plant an apple tree is today. So, you know, this stuff, sh I mean, we didn't even have enough time to be able to do it, but really we sh you should be focusing on it right away to um, uh, make sure that you're um, falling under the rules. I've got those other websites. I'll be around, well, do we have time for questions or are we out of time? I, I'll stick around if people have questions. Do we have time? Okay, you do this or jump up and down, so okay. it, you know, okay. this is cool. attention. Thank okay, you. questions. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, sales staff, prospecting. Yep. How are we expected to provide unsubscribing for prospecting you, for example? Can't do it. Okay. Like that, the whole, the whole <coughs> electronically prospecting is, is exactly what this is capturing. So you don't have an existing relationship. It's someone new. There's not an ongoing business relationship. You don't have any implied consent. You want to address, I want to sell wills, so accountants, they make great people for me. I want to send an email to all the accountants in this city saying, hey, your clients don't have wills, send them to us. I can't do it. I get caught by this legislation. I've got to, you know, there's a funny thing in today's day of technology. Um, uh, we, we did, and I know this is going to blow people away, we did a letter, actually it was investment advisors, I wrote a letter to them and said, hey, we're in your neighborhood, we'd be interested in helping your clients. I actually signed it, put it in an envelope, got a stamp and sent it. And you know the surprising thing, I always thought that the response rate would have been like horrible. We got seven out of 40 people who approached us afterwards say, thank you, like we really want to start sending our clients to you. 
now maybe Canada Post has something to do with this, and they're like, trying to keep it. No, you can't. You can't. You can't process. That's the whole point of this legislation is to catch people. You got to be very, very careful, like very careful, because the fines are huge. So we'd have to look at the, the exact and how it was on their website, and it, like it's conspicuous. Like there's, there's, you got, and, and you know they talk about them sending something to you, where so you got to be very careful. The legislation is when you push sin. So it's, it's the individuals. You know, arguably, if you, if you had something specific that said a person, so um, we want to get something, in, in your newsletter, um, and Joe stopped doing it, and now Sally's sending out the newsletter, presumably, but usually it's just a, a blank. You should be okay with those, um, but it's, it's, you gotta look at each and every message. So there, there is no blanket answer for things. It's each message that it sends out. Does that message, um, not a continuous stream of them, does that message fall under an exemption? Does it fall under the legislation? Yeah. Um, I work with registered charity, but you said earlier about if you're sending something like, oh, you've got a gallon event or stampede breakfast or something like that. So in my email, uh, if I'm saying I need volunteers for a stampede breakfast, that's... Arguably it gets caught. You know, and that's, that's the kicker is that there's, there's things that it shouldn't. You know, the, and the legislation is clearly like, specifically asking for money should be okay. Well, it is okay. But I can't ask for volunteers. You can't ask, yeah. Now, again, is a court going to say, right. it's going to be, they're going to look at what you've done. If you've sent it out to a million people who've never asked for it, if you sent it to existing volunteers, but if you have a volunteer bank, get their consent. So get their consent now to send them, oh, there's 100 people that volunteer. We send out, you know, we need a casino filled. Um, we get our permission, we're getting everyone consent. Can we send you consent to ask for casino volunteering? Done. That's, that's what you should be doing. I'm making my way around just so it's a whole tight everyone. How will it be policed? Uh, be Three, four ways. Um, CRTC, Privacy Commissioner, um, uh, they're setting up a complaints department through, directly through the, the um, spam legislation. And then in three years, private action. So now the police is every single person that could possibly receive your email. It doesn't get much better than that. Yep. So, so the question is, what should the content of the consent be? And, the, and I mean, it has to be very clear. It has to be anything that you're going to send them for. So you can have it sufficiently broad to capture everything, but list it out. Don't just say, send you anything at all, because it has to be clear. And that, that, that is okay, even if you don't do any of those things right now, but you plan to down the road. If they've consented, they have in writing, you're okay. No, if you're like communications uh, within the, an organization or about the organization within its company that are, are business related, you're okay. Sorry. So if, if the question, if I understand it, boiled down, if you have employees that are getting emails and then someone ceases to be an employee, if you send them stuff, you're caught. And, and if you created the, if you caused it to happen, so you sent them all, if someone stops being employed, take them off. You know, or your employees have work email addresses, not their own Hotmail account. Follow your due diligence. Okay. Someone stops being an employee, take them off. You can, yeah, you, you've done your due diligence. It was sent out. We did not initiate it. We didn't cause it. It was from this third party. Just say, yep.
Clicks okay. Yeah, no. So it, what, what is required for consent? Anything that acknowledges that consent. So again, you can't have a pre-populated toggle on something that you've sent out to them. You can't force them to opt out, but you can have them um, you know, check yes, pick it. it you know, arguably, you can also just have accept without having them to check it. You just can't pre-populate the, the check. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so you have to the the email address that they're asking for consent for is going there. Now, if a person changes their address and they send you an update, hey, I've changed my email address, then I mean they they haven't taken away their consent. Yeah. So do you send that email and you have that option? You don't hear anything back from them? Then you basically just check them off the list. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, unless they flat fall under the implied consent for the first three years, um, you have to take them off the list. Yeah, but we're, we're basically doing is rebuilding our entire database okay, for, for as we get consents in. Yeah. Sorry, so when you say implied consent for the first three years, is that three years starting July 1st, 2014? Yeah, so July 1st, 2017 is when there is no more implied consents. You need express consents only. But that implied consent still has to happen prior to July. Right, so, to keep, so implied consent is okay for the next three years, but does not count after that. Yes, that's right. Two quick things. Um, old consent still good till July seventeenth, July twenty seventeen. No, unless it falls under. So old consents are not like the the, the yeah. legislation is very clear. You need new consents, um, unless it's an implied consent situation where you might have an exemption for those that time. Okay, and the second one. In your opinion, how likely is this legislation to ch to stand up to challenge? Because I imagine once ten million dollar fines start being levied. There's going to be a few laws. So, so the question's a good one. You know, what are the chances of it happening? And obviously, I mean, there has been no prosecution, so there's nothing to, to base it on. They say the, the courts are usually pretty intelligent. If someone is spamming and, and like flying in the face of, hey, everyone buy Viagra from this website, you know, chances of the courts are going to come down pretty heavy on them. If you have, you know, a small little roofing company and you've sent an email out to five people, you know, oh, you know, I, I, I know there's a hailstorm in your area. We've done your neighbor's houses. Do you want to, us to do your house too? Um, you know, it is still spam, two minutes. Um, you still get caught, you're still caught in there. You know, would they imply, uh, hit you with the maximum penalty? Probably not. I mean, you know, someone who sues you for $200 because they've received it, they have to go through the process too. You know, even if they win, they might get cost. The court could say, yeah, we're going to give you a dollar because you've done this a thousand times and you're, you're looking to get your name out there on spam lists and, uh, or they could just dismiss it. So, there, I mean, that is the reliance on that is that there has to be, they have to do it. But if, if you're not working and that's what you decided to do for a living is just sue people, yeah, you've got to put out the $200 and a lot of these guys don't have it. Um, and they're not hiring lawyers to do it. They're showing up themselves. Um, it, there's a balance. And, but the courts are, you know, the courts will look at the situation and they're not, they're not dumb. You know, we've seen situations where people go in front of the court and our whole argument is, um, judge, read their affidavit because listen to what they're saying and um, the court's like, they just get angry. Like, don't waste our time. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay, so the question is about retirement groups or people who leave a company, so yeah, alumni yeah, organizations, yeah. still gets caught. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely still gets caught. Um, who isn't to ask questions? Yeah. So the question again, if you're sending emails out of country, you're okay as long as you comply with that con com uh, country's legislation. And I'm being told that it's time to pull a dance. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. If you have questions, call or email. Them. I think we can all agree. Lots of information. And uh, almost, it's one of those sessions where you have more questions than you have answers just because of all the it's information, just the nature. right? So a couple of things. Just one thing for you. Um, the slide presentation, are you willing to share it? Sorry to yeah. do that in front of a room. Yeah, I'll, people, I can but, email it to you. But yeah, I said okay. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. This was really informative. Um, somebody just told me that this does not apply to faxes. 
So besides the tweets about Canada Post, which I think are hilarious, um, that somebody said, a telemarketer said that it didn't apply to faxes. So who knows, maybe we have an old technology that's going to be revived from the ashes, right? Yeah, and we hate those. We still get those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, our next event is June 20th. Watch the website, um, Presser for Information. Um, the reason that... Um, I, it's not egotistical that I talk about trending in Canada or talk about the engagement. These events, we put them on so that you can come for free. Our sponsors, their payback is the online communication. So anytime that you can give them kudos, if you need their services, please, you know who they are. If you need their services, contact them. But uh, that, that's the payback that they get, and we really appreciate it. We did the Canada thing like halfway through the event today. Like, you guys rock. Um, Tanya came with lunches, and she didn't arrive today till just after 9 o'clock. Apologize for that. But it was an interesting, when I was saying goodbye to her in the parking lot, I just said, like, I hadn't warned anybody, and I didn't... Because it was so last minute, I had enraged for her to, she, she brought them because they all had to be refrigerated last night and I didn't have room in my house to do it. And, you know, the story goes on and on and on. And she said, Donna, those people were waiting for food today. Do you think any of them were hungry? That is what kids are going to school. Can you imagine what it's like to concentrate when you have the growlies like that? And, and uh, so just an interesting correlation that I, uh, that I thought that I would add to this. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you to ATB Financial for hosting the room. They, um, the, if anybody wants to do a donation, Jeff is matching. So the, the pails is there. And um, thank you so much to uh, Caffeinated Computing for, act, for sponsoring today. Really appreciate it. Okay? Okay. And Jeff, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.